So I learned to redeem uh, at five years old from my father in Waterloo, Iowa. And uh, I showed some promise. Uh, I beat some of my father's friends. <laughs> he was proud of me, but he wasn't really a chess player. And, you know, I, in my uh, elementary years, you know, I, I would play people around the neighborhood. And I did pretty well. But, you know, I never really had any formal training. And then, uh, at about age 16, we moved to Cleveland Heights. And Cleveland Heights had uh, some really good chess players there. In fact, uh, the year after I graduated, they won a, a national high school title. And uh, Calvin Blocker was one of the main saves on those teams. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the kids of the chess club, you know, they would sort of like uh, laugh at me. Uh, they would say, like, because I used to always go for scholars. <laughs> and, and they used to say, you know, somebody play that kid that goes for scholars, mate, you know, and uh, they used to beat up on me pretty good. And, uh, one time I remember uh, there was a kid that I, I played with and we were playing in the library and the librarian kicked us out of the library in the middle of our game. So I, you know, I said, you know, we were going to go out uh, somewhere else to finish the game. And I said, well, let's carry the board like this, you know, uh, so we know where all the pieces are. And, and he said, no, that's not necessary. I know where all the pieces are. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this kid is like God, you know? <laughs> Who can do this, you know? Not, not knowing that, you know, like later on, uh, I would learn how to do similar things, you know, because I, I, you know, I would develop a chess memory. So for a while, you know, I thought that, um, you know, maybe, maybe I sort of questioned a little bit whether I was smart enough to play chess. You know, maybe I thought that, you know, some kids were, were just smarter than others and they played better chess, you know? Like, I didn't know that there was a way that you could, uh, you know, there was a pathway to get be getting better, studying, playing, going over your games and all this kind of thing. Um, so then, you know, I, I started to get into table tennis when I was younger. And I went, I went out to California and there was a lot of people that played chess in the table tennis clubs, I started to get more in interested in it. And I came back to Cleveland, and uh, there was a place, uh, I didn't have a television at my apartment, and there was a, at that time, you could go on college campuses, and nobody would chase you out. So I would go down to the uh, Case Western Reserve, Leutner Cafeteria. And uh, they had table tennis, you know, and I wanted to go impress a couple girls, so, you know, I went down there and played. And, you know, I, I also, you know, I ran into Calvin Blocker and some of his friends that really liked table tennis. And, you know, Calvin sort of took me under his wing and started, you know, teaching me a little bit about uh, chess. You know, in fact, uh, you know, that's... Uh, that's where I got uh, beaten by the fried liver attack for the first time <laughs> at Lloydner Cafeteria. I'll never forget it, you know. It's like one of those things you never forget. Like, what? <laughs> you know, where is this attack coming from, you know? But I, you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I learned from it. I, I was curious about, you know, the game. Um, and then, you know, later on, I started playing in coffee shops because coffee shops were just uh, starting up. And you know, there was a coffee shop called the Arabica, and uh, it was at the corner of Coventry and Euclid Heights. And there was a lot of chess players there. And uh, the first thing I learned was I had to play a little faster because no one wanted to play with me because I moved too slow. <laughs> so I would just sit there and, oh, you want to play? No, no thanks, you know. <laughs> so pretty soon I figured it out, you know, hey, 
you got to play a little fast, you know. And then, you know, uh, there was a group of African American men. They sort of they sort of welcomed me to their group, you know. And um, the thing about about their group was, no matter whether you won or you lost, they always made it feel like you had fun. Um, so there was a guy named George uh, that I played with a lot, and, and a guy named Big Al. And uh, those guys had, they had all the same, you know. Uh, Big Al, you know, he, he, we played, they played a lot with the clock, and uh, what Big Al would do would be like, when I was running out of time, he would just very slyly put his queen right where I could capture it. And I'd get all excited, and I'd grab his queen, and he'd say, oh, shucks, your time's out. <laughs> and uh, everybody would start laughing, you know. <laughs> so, you know, again, you know, I, I learned, you know, you, you know, you got to play a little faster. But, uh, you know, George had, he had all the same, you know. He had a whole repertoire of same, you know, like uh, he'd walk into the room and he'd say, I'll have the wit up with them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like when he would uh, make a, a really strong threat, and you, and you realize that he would say, hey, man, I just want to be your friend. <laughs> 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 and uh, he had all these things, you know, and he would, uh, he would, it would be like he was talking to his, uh, his family or something. He was, yeah. He's after our goodies, y'all. <laughs> He's after our best stuff. And then another one was, they told us, no matter what, never, ever forget how to run. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had an arch rival called Ella Taco. <laughs> Ella Taco was this great big, you know, uh, guy. And uh, they had this rivalry, and they would play... One time, they played all night long on a garbage can at the corner of Coventry and Euclid Heights Boulevard with a with a, uh, a hard board, uh, and they played like something like seventy five games. And then at six o'clock in the morning, when the Arabica coffee shop opened up, you know, they came out and they served them both coffee. And, you know, the score was something like you know fifty to. 45 or something, you know. But, you know, the, the point was, was uh, they knew how to have fun with chess. Uh, George, had, George had a saying, you know, he was maybe around 1,600 strength. But he had, and uh, he, he was never married, and he one time told me, he said, one thing that I've never taken seriously, a couple things I've never taken seriously in life, chess and women. <laughs> you know, to them it was you know to him it was all it was all fun you know everything was fun and so you know that was nice to uh, to to sort of uh, have a group of people where you know you could just go and escape from life and have some fun and at the same time you know learn something. Obviously, you know, I learned something along the way, but it wasn't all this, you know, super ego, you know, uh, uh, super high pressure stuff. You know, it was, it was learning, but it was also fun. And uh, so back in the day uh, in Cleveland, the first serious chess experience I had was there was a, uh, a chess team league called the CCA, Cleveland Chess Association. And there was all these teams, like, you know, there was many, many ethnic teams, you know, the, the Croatians, the Lithuanians, the Parma Chess Club had a team. Uh, there was all kinds of teams and there was four divisions. And it was non USCF rated, but it was very long time control. Like, you know, 50 and, uh, 
At that time, there was no sudden death. So it was like 50 and 2, and then, you know, uh, 25 and 1. And then if you, if you didn't finish your game, you had to adjourn it. And, uh, and the person that adjourned the game had to go back to the, other, to the other guy's home club to finish the game. So it sort of encouraged you to finish it out, no matter how late at night it got. You know, sometimes games would be finishing at 12, 1 in the morning, you know, in the CCA. So I got into the CCA. And the first time I was in Division Three, and my record was one win, five losses. Okay, and uh, the next year, Calvin said to me, he said, you know, you're getting to be a pretty good player now. Uh, you have to play in Division One. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> I said, you know, how am I going to justify playing in Division One when I went one and five in Division Three? He said, I don't care. You have to play in Division One. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I'll try to organize my own team and see if I can see if they'll let me in Division One. Okay? So sure enough, organized my own team. Division One. Okay. We call ourselves the you know the Heights Revolutionaries. Yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, we, we were, you know, uh, a bunch of people that made, maybe 10 years earlier protested the Vietnam War, and, you know, like everybody was at, be asking us about our name. But anyway, um, so I'm going to show you um, the first game where the Cleveland chess community really started to take some notice of me. And um, there was a guy from the Lakewood blockaders at the time. And his name was Rudy Pichak. And uh, his name is in the, the book that Calvin recommends a lot called The Art of the Checkmate. It categorizes various types of uh, checkmate patterns. And his name is in there uh, under the uh, heading of Blackbirds. Okay? And there's a little biography of all these players and it said, you know, Rudolf Pichak was a very strong Czechoslovakian master. And uh, this Lakewood team sort of had this guy Rudy as like their secret weapon. weapon he hadn't lost in two years. And uh, so our home site, it happened to be this, uh, this restaurant called Genesis 129. Uh, it was the most uh, strict dietary restaurant probably in the United States at the time. It had, it had no meat, no coffee, no white sugar, no white flour, no soda, okay? And uh, so they had, a, and they had a, a stage where anybody that wanted to could come up and play music. And they, you know, it was one of these hip, you know, I mean, you know, in short, it was a hippie place. You know, it had psychedelic tiles on the ceiling and, you know, you know, it was a crazy place. But anyway, we had a, there was a side room there. And I had to tell these, you know, at the time, people were still allowed to smoke cigarettes while they played chess. This was 1980. This was just when tournaments started to become, you know, non-smoking. So I had to tell these guys that they weren't allowed to smoke. Because, you know, it was a no-smoking restaurant. So they got, they got angry, you know, like, what do you mean we can't smoke? You know, and, uh, they started, you know, fooling around with them, you know, like they would take out the cigarettes and put it in their mouth and play with it. They wouldn't light it, but, you know, they were, you know, sort of thumbing their nose at me taking out cigarettes and, and stuff like that. And this Rudy guy, he didn't like it. You know, it was like, I could just read his mind, you know. What do you mean? This is America, you know. You're not going to tell me I can't smoke. Well, I didn't think I came to America, the land of the free, you know. I should be able to smoke. <laughs> so, so he was going to punish me and teach me a lesson, you know, about, you know, telling him 
that he couldn't smoke. Okay? So this was the game. Now, remember, at this time, I didn't know very much about chess. So, uh, you know, all I knew was, you know, Calvin Blocker told me to study Paul Morphy. You know, and you know, and then I and I studied a little bit of Paul Morphy, and I kind of got in the spirit of, you know, well, the importance of having more pieces out than your opponent. Okay, which is, of course, probably, you know, if I must say, the most important lesson in chess. Okay, develop. Okay, so anyway, this was the game. Uh, I was white. And he played this move, uh, Rudy's Black. And this is called the O'Kelly variation of the Sicilian defense. Okay. The idea is that if white tries to open up the game with d4 and pawn takes and knight takes, black can play this move, e5. Okay. And there's no, no pieces going to d5. So, you know, I, I knew that that was the gist of it. And so, as a result, I said, well, how can I take advantage of that and not go into that whole thing? Again, like I said, I knew nothing about theory, you know, very little about theory. So I decided, well, maybe I, you know, I, know, I knew that they had something called a C3 Sicilian. So I said, well, I'll try to play a C3 Sicilian, where maybe this move A6 is no good. Okay? So he played this move, which is still considered the right move to play for black in this situation even today. Now, most players with white, you know, they think that this would be the only move would be pawn face pawn. And we would get into a C3 type Sicilian, where maybe I could still try to prove that the pawn on a6 was not as good of a, a move as, as something else. Okay, but instead, I went here. Now, this is similar to an advanced French, okay? But in a, in a French defense, for those of you who know chess, um, oftentimes the pawn's already here, and the bishop can't come out, okay? The bishop is very locked in. But here, the bishop's not locked in, okay? So after I go here, he continues to play normal moves like in a French defense, and he moves the knight out. Okay, then I go here, because this is the idea of the, uh, the, the advanced variation of the French. Um, the idea is to keep a pawn here so this knight can't come to its optimal square. Okay, so he plays this move, taking advantage of the fact that this pawn isn't here, and going into a French defense. Now he's threatening to go bishop takes knight, and then if I take with the queen, he can go pawn takes, pawn takes, knight takes, with a pawn ahead. So already, so I have to go bishop here. I don't know if I had to, but I felt like I had to. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, exactly what was going on here. Okay? So I went bishop here. And um, he went here. And uh, again, I don't know what to do. You know, I don't want to take here and let his bishop start developing quickly. So I played this move, you know, still kind of wandering about, not knowing what I should play in this position. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a dumb kid and I don't know very much about theory, you know? So he goes, uh, take, take, Bishop check, I went knight here, and then he went queen here. And I'm thinking, you know, like, what's so great about this, you know? Um, but, you know, I see that there's, you know, a certain amount of pressure. And uh, I came up with this move. 
put the queen here. Okay? Um, and I expected him, you know, to just go knight to e7 and continue with castle. You know, this is this is what I expected. Okay? Everybody see okay? Hopefully. All right. Okay, so, but he decides, okay, I'm going to attack the white center with this move. Pawn to f6. Now, one of the things that, uh, one of the principles that the open game players, like, like myself, understand is that you generally don't open the game wide open when you're not, when you have uh, worse development. So right now, if you look at it, black's got one, two, three, four pieces out. White's got one, two, three, four, five pieces out. And after white castles, you know, white has every piece in the back. Black still has to get this knight out and still has to castle. Okay? So I figured if I go pawn takes pawn, that helps him develop his knight to the center. And then when he castles, he's going to have this rook on this nice open fire. So obviously, now sometimes in chess, you want to just go along with whatever your opponent wants you to do because it's the best move anyway. But the other times, you want to be oppositional. You want to say, okay, I know what you're trying to do, but I'm not going to allow it. I'm going to initiate my threats because I think my threats are more significant than your threats. <laughs> simple, simple as that, okay? So I said, you know, like, I took about 20 minutes on this move because with these long time limits, we used to think nothing of, you know, taking substantial amounts of time on certain moves. You know, when you have 50, when you have two hours to make 50 moves and you want to take a 40 minute think on one move or a half an hour, you could do it. And uh, I did on a lot of occasions. So here, I took about 20 minutes and I said, you know, I'm just going to castle and I'm going to let him do exactly what he wants to do. Okay? So he goes ahead and he goes, he goes, bishop takes knight. I go, bishop takes bishop. And now he goes to win a pawn with the idea of, you know, pawn takes pawn, and if I take back, he's going to go knight takes pawn. But I saw all this, you know, when I, when I initiated Castleman, I saw all this possibility. And I said, the heck with it, I'm playing here. Okay? And then, when he played this move, I took here. And his, his face turned red. <laughs> because his whole position is falling apart. Okay? There's nothing he can do. The rook's under attack. The knight's under attack. The pawn's under attack. Every one of my pieces is developed. Okay? So he played it out a few more moves. And... Um, the guys, and then he resigned, and the guys that were in his, uh, on his team, they were like too embarrassed to ask him, you know, like, what happened in the game? So they said, uh, and they said to him, Rudy, how did you win so fast? It looked like, you know, you had a difficult position. And he said, I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, and that's when Cleveland Chess first started to take a little bit of notice of Mike Jolson and, you know, they, they didn't laugh at the Heights Revolutionaries anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we finished, you know, like so-so, you know, I, I probably finished like about 50%, but, you know, 50% in the top division was pretty darn good when you consider the year before I went one and five in the third division. So it was good, good progress for me, and good suggestion, good, good suggestion by Calvin. Even though you know, uh, I had to, it wasn't really my style to be, you know, like, hey, I want to be in first division. But it turned, and, and people thanked me 
for insisting that I be in first division. You know, like some of the people that were still that were questioning me earlier. Um, so that was that was one game. Um, most of these games that I'm going to be showing are what they call miniatures. You know, they're they're short games, 20 moves and less. I figure the more of them I could show, the more stories I could tell. I mean, I'm not going to be going in like uh, super depth, you know, uh, and some of them are not that type of game. Some of them, they hinge on, you know, one, one or two mistakes and boom, the game is over. So now, a couple of years later, uh, I played another game in the CCA. Uh, at that time, there were three German-American clubs, not one. There was one on West 140th Street in Lorraine uh, called Banneter Hall. There was one in the far west side called Lano Park. And there's the, the regular Parma Club that's been around over 50 years. So this was the one on West 140th in Lorraine. And I was playing a guy named Bob Miller who was, you know, maybe at that time, like around uh, a 2,000 player. That's about where I was at at the time, maybe maybe slightly higher. Um, but this game I found very entertaining. And uh, I thought, I think you will too. Okay, it's another Sicilian defense. doing a little bit of shorthand, just like this, okay? Now, I, I don't know if everybody knows the idea of the Sicilian, but that is, the, for black wants to trade a pawn away from the center for a pawn in the center, therefore gaining two center pawns to white's one. Or as the coin I phrase, black has a preponderance of pawns in the center. <laughs> so, Anyway, enough of that corniness thing. Okay, so knight here, knight here, okay. Now this is a very standard position, okay. Uh, it's called the four knight Sicilian. It can go in many directions. There's pawn to e5, there's pawn to e6, there's pawn to d6. But my opponent played a move that theory doesn't like. Um, my opponent played this move. Which is, in, in most Sicilians, that move is just fine. Like in the Nador Sicilian, which uh, Bobby Fischer used to play with the pawn here, this is the move that defines the Nador Sicilian that Bobby Fischer used to play. It was pawn to a6. So a lot of people, they just figured like, well, this is the kind of move you just throw in. Every Sicilian, you know, you play a6, how can you go wrong? You know, that's... That's how they thought, okay? And that's, I'm sure that's how my opponent thought. Well, what the heck? You know, this is a tight match, you know? I think I'll just throw in a6 and I don't even have to think about it. It's a move that, you know, everybody plays in the Sicilian. But no, I knew that in this exact position in the Sicilian, this was a mistake, okay? So I took here, and the reason why it's usually con this is usually considered a mistake is you usually don't want to have pawns outside the center moving towards the center because then they have more influence over the center. Very simple. So that's why, unless there's a really good reason, you don't usually go knight takes knight in this exact position. But here, it's, it's warranted because you can play pawn here and embarrass the knight, okay? Now the knight is embarrassed. It's like if the knight can't go here, can't go here, can't go here. It can go here, but you know, that's like saying, hey, you know, I'm sorry I didn't mean it. I'm gonna go home and hide. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't wanna, it's kind of like, you know, a little bit uh, embarrassing. Not to mention it's, uh, it's an advantage for white. 
So anyway, my opponent decides, okay, I'm gonna try to make it, I'm gonna try to make sense out of this whole mess. I'm gonna put the knight here and I'm gonna sacrifice a pawn. Okay. So I say, hey, you know, I you know, in order to prove my advantage, I have to grab the pawn. So I go knight takes knight. He goes pawn takes knight. I go queen takes knight. I'm sorry, queen takes pawn. So then he goes here. And I'm thinking like, well, the logical move that everybody would play normally is to put the bishop here and get ready to cast. And then black will play here. But you know, black has some annoying uh, possibilities now in the open game. This is a good bishop. This is going to be a good bishop. So even though uh, white's a pawn up, you know, this position is not so simple. It's not necessarily going to do what they call win itself. You know, there's still, you know, and, you know, sometimes uh, I had a reputation, rightfully so, for getting in a lot of time pressure. So, you know, sometimes I used to always say, say to myself, you know, jokingly, like, I better reach at least two pawns off to the end game if I'm going to win. Because <laughs> I, I had a bad reputation in my younger days. Because I played so many violent games that a lot of times I didn't get into very many end games. Sometimes I didn't play them well. And I, and I didn't always have the most confidence in the end game. Um, and, you know, I have a little more now. But I'm just saying, you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to play this bishop mode. So I thought, I took another 40 minute think on this move. <laughs> you know, this move, you know, it's like, you know, most people would come by and say, you know, what do, what do you know, what is he doing? You know, he's sitting there taking 40 minutes. You know, what could he possibly be thinking about? Okay? And, uh, but actually I had some very devious thoughts. <laughs> and also, I, I found like some really profound humor in this position. And, and I saw this move that had a lot of humor potential. Very humorous move. Okay? And, uh, I, I, you know, the more I looked at it, the more I said, you know, you got to play this. It's, it's, it's too uh, entertaining. It's too, too much fun. It's too fun. Okay. So I played this move. Okay. Which looks like it's a ridiculous move. You know, you just put your pawn in the middle of somewhere where it can, where it can be captured two different ways. Okay. So, but this was the humorous thing that I that I saw which I don't think I've ever seen exactly this kind of uh, scenario in my life. And that was, if he takes this way, I go queen takes queen, he goes king takes. I go bishop here attacking the rook, okay? And then if he goes here, me, the comedian, <laughs> so you have to be a little bit of a comedian to play chess. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I, I was just enamored with that. You know, like that is just too much fun. Okay. Look on B A. Yeah. Thank you. So anyway, he played a different way, but I saw that, that that move loses on the spot. Um, he took this way, okay? And now I saw this little trick, queen check, only move. Queen here, forking the two rows. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he took a very hard ribbing from his teammates for losing like this. <laughs> but uh, it was fun. It was a fun game to win. And, and, the, and the weird thing is, is, you know, when I... 
when I prepared to do this, this lecture, I figured, well, let me put this into the chess engine and see what the chess engine would say about the way I played. All these moves, including pawn to e6, were computer best moves. Yes. Yeah. This is, after all, the first day celebration, of course, right? Right. Okay. All right. I am uniquely qualified <laughs> to take this moment to speak with my friend Mike here because we both were born in 1954. <laughs> and let's go back a little bit, Mike, and find out what was happening at the time we were born. <laughs> okay. So we go ahead. All right. Well, first of all, the first electric drip coffee machine. <laughs> <What? laughs> the very first one. That's why we have those uh, coffee makers now, right? Okay. Second of all, the first microwave was invented in 1954. <laughs> okay. the, the favorite foods: deviled eggs and green bean casserole. <laughs> <laughs> Shared birth years. John Travolta, Denzel Washington, Jackie Chan, Catherine O'Hare, and what? I can't believe it. Amy? <laughs> 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 All right. And guess what else was invented that year? Huh. Something we all love at Easter time. Peas. Huh? They were invented in 1954 by a scientist in Pennsylvania. He comes chewing gum for Easter. So we got a peeps. And who likes peeps here? Not me. <laughs> All right, the last thing. The last thing I'm going to say about 1954 is that we're all called baby boomers. We're kind of like the falling off end of the baby boomers. We're kind of like dinosaurs. So in, in, that, res in that respect, I'm happy that Mike and I both are here to share this, what, septenary, what do they call it? Septenary. Yeah, septenary as we are. And I hope everyone here who is either that age or more, we want to be just like you when we grow up. <laughs> game, you know, uh, like, the first master I ever beat was in my first Ohio Chess Congress. At that time, if you were over 1800, you had to play in the championship section. So my first Ohio Chess Congress, I scored three and a half out of six, which was very respectable at that time, especially because I was one of the lower rated players. But I played in that tournament for many years. In fact, like maybe about 30 years in a row. I made it, that would be the one tournament I made time to play, no matter what. And I played a lot of really, uh, a lot of really great games, a lot of really lousy games. But I'm, I'm probably gonna just show you the really good ones. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I had this friend, uh, his, his name was uh, Ken Panzel. He actually uh, was the tournament director in my first tournament. And he got me into running tournaments. Uh, I played my first chess tournament at 25, but by 26, I was already a tournament director. So it was kind of something that was like uh, meant to be. It was a calling. and. Uh, it, it, it came very early in my chess career that I wanted to uh, I wanted to develop the chess community. I wanted to give back. Okay. So Ken Panzel and I became friends, uh, and uh, you know he sort of encouraged me to become a tournament director. And I had to play him at the Ohio Chess Congress, and uh, I knew that he was a very uh, theoretical player. Uh, believe it or not, 
there were theoretical players even before there was uh, computer databases. Okay, there were just people that liked to study books and liked to study theory, and that was never me. Uh, and not to my not to my uh, benefit either. You know, like what I loved about chess was figuring out things over the board, not doing research. You know. It's probably why I don't have a college degree, never finished college, okay? Uh, I, my learning uh, method has always been learn it by doing. And that's kind of the way I learned how to play chess. I played a lot of chess and I studied the games that I played and I was blessed with a really good memory. I remembered a lot of them, some of them even to this day you could see that you know, even just going over them a little bit, I, I have a lot of them committed to memory. And it's just my path, okay? But I knew this guy, Ken Panzel, he was a theoretician, even back in the day. And I wanted to play something against him that maybe got him out of theory a little bit, okay? Now at the time, the CCA, they had something that they called uh, the Cleveland Chess Bulletin. And the Cleveland Chess Bulletin was an interesting magazine. It had everything from like a gossip column, you know, it had a, it had a column called Wood Pushers Woodpile. <laughs> and it would talk about, oh, so-and-so, uh, you know, got a new job at this place, or so-and-so, you know, moved to California, and, you know, and then, but it also had games and articles. So I looked one day, just for fun, I was looking, leaping through the, CCA Bulletin, and I saw this guy from Canada that used to come to uh, Cleveland tournaments, and he he had an article about uh, the exchange variation of the rival pets and what he liked to play against. Now, I didn't know anything about this variation, but it just kind of fascinated me. And, uh, Calvin Blocker would, I, one time I asked Calvin, and I said, uh, well, you know, how do you figure out, you know, like what moves to play? You know, what do you do if, you, uh, if you're not sure about a move? And his advice was, just play, he would say. Uh, if you, uh, you know, if it's a bad move, your opponent will show you why. You'll learn something. <laughs> you know. A lot of times I learned something. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes if I didn't know what was going on, then neither did my opponent know what was going on, <laughs> which I found out too. It was complicated enough for me not to understand it. Maybe they didn't understand it. Maybe it was actually good. So, you know, if I thought a move had merit and I wasn't sure, I would play it. Nowadays, a lot of young players, they're taught like, well, unless you're 100% certain that a move is good, you don't play it. You, know, you don't take chances, and you don't play something that you don't understand. But not me. You know, My thing was, if you don't understand it, play it, learn something. So I saw, I saw this article in the CCA Bullet, and I figured, hey, I'm going to play this idea. I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to play it and learn something. So anyway, um, I was black in a, in a rival pets. This is called the exchange variation, for those of you who are not so familiar with chess. And you know you're, you you don't want to take here right away because um, if you take here right away, the queen comes here forking the knight and pawn, okay. And then when the knight moves, you get your pawn back. So the idea is you delay, and you keep this threat in your back pocket of going knight takes pawn, but you don't go for it, you know, immediately. You keep it as a threat. So Bobby Fischer, 
He used to like to revive old openings. Like he would go over games with old masters and find ideas that maybe some people had given up on. And he would revive them. And so he revived this exchange variation of the rival pets. And a lot of people started playing it. And the movie he revived it with was Castles. And now uh, this, this strategy that this guy had was to play bishop here, which was a normal move. Now, obviously, if this bishop's not here, knight can capture pawn. And this is an important center pawn. So you have to be ready with what to do after this move. Yes, uh, Wesley? Uh, I like to play h5. Alfred. You like to play h5, and so does, like, most... Uh, or most normal people like to <laughs> The idea of this is this is called uh, the fishing pole, for those of you who don't know. The idea is that when white takes here and you take with the pawn, the knight has to move, and then and then you go queen down here to h4 and you checkmate the heck out of white's king. So he can't take it right away. Okay? It's called, a, it's called a fishing pole because you try to get uh, you try to get white to go fishing. And then, you know, he gets caught. So anyway, this is the most popular move is that Will, one Wesley suggested, which was, you know, h5. And, uh, but anyway, I, this Canadian guy had this other idea. What happens if I go here? Okay. So now the, the next obvious move is, well, I'm going to go move my pawn here. And I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to take that pawn. Because that pawn's an important center pawn. And even though my king is somewhat compromised, you know, uh, the, the value of the center pawn is more, okay, than the compromised king side. That's what you're betting. So I go here, Ken Panzel eats my pawn. Okay, now I looked this up today and I was surprised to see that some of the computer evaluations say this kind of stuff is okay for black. Like it was recommending like night here, which I don't know why, <laughs> but you know. Uh, but maybe, maybe this isn't so bad, but you almost never see this at the highest level of chess. You almost never see, um, you never, you almost never see white be allowed to take this pawn. Like at top level grandmaster chess. There must be a reason why. You know? I would assume. Okay, so anyway, the plan was to go here. Okay? Now, if knight takes bishop, then the rook file is open. And if, if knight goes back here, for example, or, or knight here, you could open the rook file anyway. Okay, so one way or the other, you know, and if pawn goes here, pawn takes pawn. One way or the other, the rook file is going to get open. Okay, that's the whole idea. Open the rook file. So he takes it. He takes my bishop. I take here. He's got my center pawn. I got the rook file. And I figured, well, you just got to wing it now, Michael. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got to figure it out. You got to get some play, you know. You got, you got a little compensation, maybe not enough, but hey. So anyway, he goes king here. I, I move my queen here, dreaming of maybe someday going here or trying to open up. Okay. He goes here with the queen, you know, he's just gonna guard, you know, all these pawns. I went bishop to d6. He went pawn to d4, I went here. Okay, and now, when I looked at the computer eval for this, it said, white is maybe a, at least a, a point ahead here. But here's the danger, see. The danger is, when somebody plays moves that are like out of theory, 
some players have a tendency, if they know the theory, to get cocky. And they'll say, well, you know, this is just crap. And I can just play anything because, you know, I know that this is the theory. I know it's garbage. And, uh, and, and you know, why is this guy insulting me playing like this, you know? <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to play normal, trade a few pieces down, and uh, I should be winning. But the, the danger of that is, you know, sometimes, even if you have a better position, if you don't play the right way, then all of a sudden, the bad position and, the, and, and what might have otherwise been the bad moves become good. And then you get in serious trouble. And that's what happened in this game. So he plays here, okay, with the bishop. Looks like a normal move, you know, hey, uh, uh, I'm getting rid of another piece, I'm a pawn ahead. You know, I'm going to trade pieces and take my pawn all the way to the bank and deposit it, you know? Uh, it turns out, believe it or not, that, you know, theory recommended something like this, followed by pawn here. Uh, but this move, after this move, it gave this evaluation as being better for black by at least one point. This was such a bad move, this normal-looking move. And I'll show you what, what happened, was bishop takes bishop, queen takes. Pawn here, okay. Now he doesn't want to go here because I can go knight here and here, threatening this fork. Okay, I can, go, I can go knight here and think about this. So he goes queen here, then I go here anyway. And now all of a sudden, guess what, as all of you guys you know, chess players know, this is what they call an outpost square. Uh, the knight can hang out there indefinitely. You can never chase it away with a pawn. It's sort of like if somebody's standing outside of your house with a, with a baseball bat, ready for, like, when you might leave and they're going to break your window in. And, you know, you have to worry every time you leave your house. Because, you know, that guy with the baseball bat <laughs> hanging around your house. That's what it's like having a knight, you know, posted on a very close square to your king. You know, uh, and they call that an, an outpost square. Okay? So now he realizes, hey, he's coming in with knight here. It's hitting this pawn with the... Now the rook is starting to make sense on the open file. Ouch. You know, maybe I'm not so great here, you know? So he goes here. And then I go check. Okay. And he goes here. Um, now, can, any, can anybody tell me the winning move? Okay, not queen takes. Not queen takes, but what? Rook takes. Yeah. Check. Now after this move, I play check. He went here, and now castles threatening to bring the rook here with a huge attack, okay? Um, this is now winning for black. You know, these pieces, these pieces cannot get out successfully. Um, this game goes on a few more moves. I, I don't want to, uh, I don't, you know, I've got other games to show, so I'm going to stop this year. But anyway, I ended up winning this game and uh, causing my, my friend to withdraw from the Ohio Chess Conference. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like he definitely did not appreciate losing to this, which I know deep down in his heart he thought was garbage. 
<laughs> and maybe it was right, but hey, it was good garbage. <laughs> I have to apologize for the fact that some of my games I don't have complete score sheets for. Partially because I'm the kind of guy that's a minimalist and throws a lot of things out. There's always like uh, certain people that they like they like to save everything, and other people that like to throw everything out. I'm the kind of guy that likes to throw everything. So I don't have all my score sheets, but I do, uh, and also I was oftentimes in such time pressure that the, uh, the last maybe 10 or 20 moves of the game I didn't have recorded, and sometimes I was too much uh, in a hurry to really try to recreate the game. So I ended up just saying, oh, forget about it, I, I know the basic gist of the game. So, my first breakthrough tournament was the Parma Open first one. And um, I was rated at the time 1885. And uh, Calvin Blocker, I, I, I was working for this landscaping company. They were the biggest landscaping company in Cleveland. But I happened to know somebody, and I got a job with them. And, and Calvin Blocker never had a job at the time. He was also close to 25. He never had a job in his life. So I got his first job <laughs> with this landscaping company. Okay? And we had to be, we had to be at work at 8 o'clock. And uh, our, uh, our foreman was an, uh, a Vietnam veteran ex-Marine. And uh, I recommended Calvin, and you know, every, you know, from time to time, you know, like when Calvin wasn't around, he would just, he would just look at me and just go like this. <laughs> like, what have you done to me? How could you do this to me? <laughs> you know, but you know, he was one of these guys that was, uh, even though he was kind of rough around the edges, he had a good heart, he was a really nice guy. He just didn't want any, anybody to ever know, you know. Um, so one time, we were sitting at the, uh, we were having lunch at the Stouffer's headquarters in, in Solon, uh, right on Harper Road. We were doing the, the uh, landscaping there with the maintenance crew. And I said to Calvin, I said, uh, he wasn't going to play in the Parm Open. And I said, Calvin, you think if I really play good, maybe I have a chance to win this thing? And uh, he said, yeah, I really think you have a chance to win. And I said, really? I'm 1885. I really have a chance to win. He said, yeah, I actually think you have a chance to win. And you know, I think part of be being a good chess coach is to instill a sense of belief in your students. And have, a, and have an emotional connection with your students. You know, in addition to just imparting the moves and the wisdom. You know, if they know that you believe in them, deep down, that's something really important. And uh, that propelled me. Um, so anyway, uh, this, is a, this is the first game, round one from the Parma Open. And uh, I stepped over the edge a little bit this, this, this game, but I ended up winning. Um, the game went like this. I was playing a guy named Andrew Zabrowski. Uh, I went 5-0 in this tournament. Four of these players later became masters. None of them were masters at the time. They were all like around 21. But I went 5-0, and this game, this is called the Hungarian defense to the Joko Cat.
So I didn't know what to do here, you know, as usual. I don't know the theory. I don't really know what to do, you know? So I said, okay, you know, you're an open games player, open the game. So I went pawn takes pawn, and he goes knight takes pawn. Now probably the quote unquote correct move here would be just to simply play bishop back. And now just try to prove that maybe this pawn in the center has more influence over the center than that pawn. And just go about, as they say, playing chess like a human being. <laughs> okay? But, you know, I don't always play chess like a human being. So I thought for a long time, another, another 40 minute thing <laughs> happened here. And uh, I thought, like, wait a minute. I said, if I can take this knife, and take this pawn and take that rook. You know, that's nine points. <laughs> I know how to count. <laughs> and this queen's only worth nine points. So, you know, maybe I can play this. And I did. I went knight takes knight. Oh my god. You know? So, obviously, he's got to go ahead with this. <laughs> And then I went here. Knight takes pawn. Okay. And then he goes queen here, which is pretty much forced. Okay. Now, there's a critical position now. Um, probably the best move is to go knight takes rook, according to the computer. Then I'm only I'm only down like maybe a point or a point and a half. But me, you know, being like really, really uh, optimistic that I am, I said, well, you know, let me leave all my well-developed pieces where they are, and let me just take this with the king. Now I got the knight, I got the bishop, I got the pawn, and I'm going to grab the rook. Wow, such a deal. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but, uh, so it ended up where um, he ended up playing something like queen here, I went pawn here, he took here, and then I, I played here. And uh, the computer said he still went, okay? But it's complicated. And I ended, you know, I don't have the score of the game. But I ended up winning the game. He said he couldn't sleep at night after this. <laughs> <laughs> he told me the next day. I couldn't sleep all night after this. So anyway, so I showed this game to Calvin. And you know, all these people, they, there was all this whispering in the playing hall. Jolson played a brilliancy. He played a brilliant scene, played a brilliant scene. Yeah. So I said, Calvin, I just played this brilliant game. You know? <laughs> and he said, well, he said, uh, it's completely unsound. <laughs> what if black just plays here? Takes advantage of the fact that your king in the center. Cuts off your bishop. Okay. Then, you know, if you go if you go bishop, bishop takes, you know, then. Uh, let's see what, what happened. Oh, then maybe something like this. And you know, when he takes the rook, then you know, I take the bishop and, and then castle queen side, and pretty soon I have a big fat nothing. Okay? But luckily it didn't happen. But I didn't know that. Me being, you know, the, in the learning mode. I didn't calculate that far. I didn't see it. You know, I, I didn't really understand why this was a completely unsound, like, sacrifice. But it worked. And uh, it turned out later on, some of the games I played were better quality than this, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was... 
a lot of fun, you know, to at least try it. You know, it was a big deal. Um, my rating went up from the, this tournament from 1885 to 2115 with the 5-0. And I thought, oh, chess is easy. I'm just going to. I'm just the most talented thing, you know, this side of the Mississippi River. I'm just going to, you know, cruise through the chess world. Well, I got a rude awakening. You know, my rating went down to uh, 1940, actually, <laughs> over a period of a couple of years. And I really had to learn a lot about how to play chess. And then, you know, I didn't really become a master. This was played in like 1980 or 81. I didn't become a master until 1988. You know. So it was a lot of struggle. And uh, you know, you never know um, when something is gonna like sink into your thick skull. You know? Like because I thought, you know, at the time that I became a master, I I was a single a parent at the time. And I had, I had two young kids, and I thought, there's no way, you know, that I should be able to do well under these circumstances, you know? But sometimes be, when you have other things going in your life, then you don't put so much emphasis on chess, you know? You just do it for fun. And then a lot of times when you do it and you have fun, you play better. It's just simple as that. When you put a lot of pressure on yourself, it's hard to play chess when you put a lot of pressure on you. It's much easier to do when you're just, you know, playing intuitively, having fun, enjoying the process. You know, you don't get into as much time pressure. Maybe you let that, maybe you let that hand move that piece a little bit faster, you know, and uh, so on. So, so this was the first tournament, like, uh, breakout tournament. I'll show you one game. Um, from the Ohio Chess Congress that um, I think is kind of uh, indicative of a little bit of my chess style. Um, so this game, it was another rival Pez game. Notice I played a lot of double king pawn openings with black. So this game was played in like 2006. And the, the opponent I played was from Toledo, a master named John Bidwell. And he won the Ohio Championship this year. And this game with me was the only game he lost. So again, he, now he plays a move that uh, I had played this variation several times, but the next move he played, I never saw, I've never seen this. Okay. And now uh, I found out later, looking at the chess engine, that it recommended this move. I'm not sure it was better than the one I played. Um, the idea is if, if this move, now bishop take, can take the pawn 
And there's no time to go bishop takes knight because you're attacking the queen. Okay. Um, but I didn't see that variation. So I simply played this move. Also maybe play it. Connecting the queen up with protecting the g7. So he takes it. And now I play knight takes pawn. Now he plays check, king, and queen retreats. Okay. Now he's threatening rookie one. So I played c6, figuring if he goes rookie one, I have knight here. And it's a game of chess, as they say. Okay, so he plays a move here. Um, theoretically, they recommend bishop d3 with about a tiny edge to one. But the move he played, I think, was Maybe the maybe he gave me a, a nice advantage. He put the bishop here. But eventually this bishop is going to be cut off. Okay? Once I play d4, it's going to be walled off, okay, from attacking my king side and also defending his king side. So I go ahead and I cast it. Now he's, uh, he tried to go crazy on me, much to his detriment, okay? He, he went pawn here. You know, I guess he wants to think about putting the bishop here at some point. Maybe if I take, you know, maybe he, he's gonna think about, I don't know, I don't know what he's gonna think about, but obviously I can't take here. He's gonna go queen takes knight so on, but I have a very obvious move here. Uh, I just very simply go, you know, uh, knight check. You know, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, when you see uh, a game that looks like it's a brilliant game, sometimes the moves uh, are, are not that amazing. This game, I didn't play anything really amazing. I just played sort of normal and let him go crazy for a change. <laughs> okay, so he went here and I grabbed another pawn. Okay. Now he decides to play bishop here. But, you know, it's too little, too late. I wall him off. Now this bishop is. No good. Okay. You know this is this is typical um, of a lot of my games where you know, like I was very, uh, you know, I've often been a very principled player. I, I, uh, I you know, I, I, I think about tempos of develop, developing pieces. You know, you, you look at it. You know, I've got every piece in the game except my bishop. He's got all these pieces not in the battle. And now he makes another move that, with a desperate attempt to break down the center. Okay. But again, I continue with the, the principal move. One move, one piece developed. You know? Simple as that. Okay, so then he, he takes here, threatening to go here, winning, you know, winning my queen. So I look at this a long time, and I come up with the winning move, queen here. Uh, stops bishop here, attacks the rook, but there's another sinister threat that's uh, a 
alongside this whole thing. And that is, uh, he, takes, he takes here, um, I went, I believe, this way. Uh, then he went here. And uh, he, he looked at the board and uh, he resigned. Do you know what's the winning? Queen takes H2. Yeah. Queen takes H2 check. King takes. Bishop check. King back. Rook takes. And uh, that was his only his only loss this tournament. A, he won the Ohio championship, and somebody came up to him and said, "Hey." Uh, Congratulations, uh, you just won the Ohio Championship. And he said, uh, he said, I don't, I don't care about that stuff. Just, just give me the check. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for coming and helping me celebrate my birthday. I, I hope you enjoyed the games. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mike. Happy birthday. So what do you think, man? Pretty good, man. We're very well done, man. I didn't know you uh, actually were funny.